Welcome to today's training, talking effectively about sea level rise, hosted by Climate Ready SMC. My name is Rachel Launder, and I'm with the County of San Mateo's Office of Sustainability. Thank you for joining us on our virtual space today. If you're having any technical difficulties, Camille Lang, also with the Office of Sustainability, is here to support. Feel free to chat Camille or any of the co-hosts throughout the event. As you join, I welcome you to introduce yourself in the chat. If you'd like to share your name, organization, and role, uh, we can all get to know each other through the chat, but we'd like to have folks stay on mute as we get started through the presentation as we have an action-packed agenda. We are recording today's event, um, and you'll receive that recording along with the slide deck and communications toolkit uh, over email after. Once again, good morning, everyone. Just as we all join the space, my name is Rachel Launder. I'd love to meet you all through the chat if you wanted to share your name, organization, and role. Great, see some folks there. Wanted to take a moment to introduce our, our team of folks who are on the call from Climate Ready um, and from Catalyst Group. Uh, Climate Ready is thrilled to be presenting an expert team of trainers. You can go to the next slide and see their faces. We have uh, Charles Gardner and Aaron Pope. Charles Gardner is the principal of the Catalyst Group. For more than 30 years, Charles has helped government agencies, communities, and businesses identify and implement solutions to complex public policy and infrastructure challenges. With deep experience in planning, facilitation, and technical analysis, Charles simplifies complexity and brings people together to get programs approved and done. Thank you, Charles, for being here. And we also have Aaron Pope, who has spent over a decade working on sustainability-focused engagement, collaboration, and planning initiatives. Aaron has served as the Manager of Sustainability Programs at the California Academy of Sciences in uh, San Francisco from 2008 to 2015. Since that time, uh, Aaron has worked as a consultant focusing on biodiversity, climate, energy, and water initiatives. He has extensive experience in storytelling, public speaking, building consensus among public and private stakeholders, and building organizational capacity. He currently is a project manager of communications with the Catalyst Group. Thank you, Aaron and Charles, for offering your expertise uh, for us today. Um, before we hand it off to them to really dive into you know, our program around talking effectively about sea level rise, I wanted to introduce Hilary Papendick, who is our uh, Assistant Director in Climate Change and Adaptation Program Manager in the Office of Sustainability uh, to offer some background on the county's efforts to engage communities to move us together on solutions to sea level rise. Hey, thank you, Rachel. Um, again, my name is Hilary Papendick, and I just wanted to give a brief background on some of the county's sea level rise efforts, as well as the development of this training and our communications toolkit. Um, so as many of you know on the call, we've, the county has been working on sea level rise for a number of years, starting uh, in 2014 under the leadership of Supervisor Pine. And our efforts have evolved over the years from developing a vulnerability assessment and, and producing studies to understand the risks to helping support the development of one shoreline, uh, the county's flood and sea level rise resilience district, to now helping provide outreach and communication support to the district and really uh, focusing on, on policy and land use solutions and our county facilities as well. So this training really helped was developed out of some needs that we heard from city staff and community members, nonprofits, businesses, and others through our climate ready collaborative convenings that we had over in 2019. Um, so we heard there was the need to develop consistent motivating messages around sea level rise and to have some support around how to talk about sea level rise in a way that helps um, people understand the complex issue and really be able to move towards solutions. So based on that need, we contracted with Catalyst to develop it, the messaging toolkit and provide the training. And we really hope this toolkit and training are beneficial to you all and others and those that you work with to be able to help provide you with more resources and tools to be able to talk effectively about sea level rise. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're excited to have this conversation and to learn from you all as well. Uh, thanks. I will now hand it over to Charles Gardner to talk about our meeting objectives. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, we're thrilled to actually get to this training. As uh, Hillary said, we started quite a while ago. Um, 
uh, sort of following the initial vulnerability assessment uh, and efforts to communicate that information. And then obviously we've had a lot of ups and downs and ins and outs, uh, particularly over the last year plus with the, the pandemic. So um, yeah. um, really, really great to get to this point and, and talk to you a little bit about uh, uh, communications and sea level rise. Um, so I wanted to start with just, uh, you know, our focus is to talk today about messaging and just to start with a little bit of, of kind of a definition of what we mean by messaging. And that's really uh, focusing on ge getting information uh, out to people effectively. So it really connects with people uh, and has your desired impact. That is, it either moves people uh, uh, to act or engage, uh, opens up thinking. Um, but our, our focus is how do we, uh, today is how do we package that information uh, uh, in a way that, that really connects with people. Um, wanted to highlight that, that today is really just a basic introduction, but a pretty, fairly going to be fairly high level given the limited time we have. Um, there's some deep concepts that we're going to introduce here, and uh, we really encourage you to, to think about um, practicing. Uh, we're going to do some, some uh, 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 work uh, to practice today, but it's, it's an ongoing learning effort um, uh, for all of us. Uh, to continue to evolve um, how we how we think about information and, and communicating it uh, effectively, uh, and it really does take a lot of practice. Um, the the messaging concepts we're going to talk today about can apply in in virtually all of the things that you're doing, whether you're you're thinking about a presentation to a community organization, um, if you're uh, thinking about a press release. Uh, if you're uh, uh, doing a media interview, if you're talking to the uh, community, you want to have a conversation with the community, it really applies in kind of any type of, of communication. So it's fairly foundational. It, it's, um, it's, uh, it's really a, a, a sort of core way of thinking about communicating uh, about climate and sea level rise. Um, and uh, it apply, I think I think the the concepts we're we're talking about today can apply more broadly than just sea level rise, and even more broadly than than climate change. So that um, uh, I think I think I I think this will have value in in kind of all of the things you do as you, um, particularly as you think about talking with your constituents or communities. Um, I think it applies um, to all the things that you do. So uh, those are our objectives. Um, Again, we're going to we're going to present a number of concepts um, uh, initially, and then we're going to have some working time. So we go to the next slide with the agenda. That'd be great. Um, so uh, so we've got some some uh, sort of an hour of of um, uh, introduction, talking about messaging, talking about a framework for thinking about communications. Um, then uh, we'll have a little bit of time if there are um, questions, but uh, we wanna get to some breakout groups. Um, so we really can kind of roll up your sleeves and, and sort of dig in and, and practice a little bit um, and then come back and sort of share what you came up with in terms of, of messages. Um, and then we're gonna, uh, we're available. We know everybody's time is tight. So, so we've really tried to pack a lot into the, the first couple of hours, but for anybody who wants to stay on, and kind of dig deeper into questions or talk about your situation and, and kind of just, you know, have some a little bit more informal Q&A and discussion. Um, we'll do that from 11 to 12. Uh, so that's our, uh, that's our agenda for today. Um, so I think um, uh, with that, I'll uh, hand it over to Aaron. Oh, well, I actually one other thing. I'll do the last slide on questions. So Again, we've tried to pack a lot into the um, into the uh, couple of hours. Um, uh, if you could hold your questions, that'd be great. If there's something that really doesn't make sense or you really have a pressing question, um, stick your hand up and we'll call on you. Um, uh, or if you want to chat something, you can do that. But we're really going to try to um, uh, focus on the, the content, um, uh, answer some questions before we go to the breakout. Uh, and then really have this Q&A session uh, for those who want to dig deeper uh, at the end. But if there is something that that um, um, really you're having a hard time following, you know, feel free to raise your hand. But we, we got a lot of content we want to uh, walk through with you 
um, and we want to make sure there's time for the, the practice session uh, as well. So um, with that, I'll hand it over to Aaron. Uh, great. Thank you so much, Charles. Um, my name's Aaron. I'm going to be doing the bulk of the rest of the training until about 10 a.m. or so. Um, so thanks for coming. It's really exciting to be here. I'm glad you guys all made time for this. So what I want to start with today is talk a little bit about conventional messaging, and specifically sea level rise messaging. And I, I want to read you this statement. Sea, level, sea levels have risen eight inches since 1990s, and the proje projection indicates sea level rise could rise by six inches by 2030, about one to two feet by 2050, and up to 6.9 feet by 2100. Greater sea level rise means more temporary and permanent flooding, saltwater intrusion, and increased erosion of the shoreline. Now, this is a, these are some very important facts about sea level rise in regards to how it affects San Mateo. There is a lot of valuable information here. There are also a lot of facts and figures. Um, this statement is taken from the San Mateo uh, Sea Level Rise Vulnerabilities Assessment. And I wanna suggest that although this is really important information, if you are speaking to someone who is not a planner, not an engineer, not someone who's kind of really deep in the weeds on sea level rise, facts and figures and information, something like this is probably not the best way to communicate and engage with someone on sea level rise. And we're gonna kind of go through why not and what you can do to kind of make your messaging more effective. Uh, this is another statement that's also in the vulnerabilities assessment. The county is already exposed to present day flooding when large rain events coincide with high tides on the San Francisco Bay making it imperative to create action steps to reduce risk. Now, I think that for many people, this looks like a much better, much more approachable statement about sea level rise if you were to, talking to a resident or someone in the community about it. And I would agree that yes, it's better, but it's also missing some key ingredients that is gonna make your message really, really effective and impactful. Um, and we're gonna talk about why not. Now, incidentally, as I said, both of these messages come from the vulnerability assessment, which is a great document. It's got a lot of really interesting information. And by its nature, it's got a lot of facts and figures and charts and graphs. Um, but the people who put together the sea level rise assessment have been doing some really deep thinking and some work on how to make the assessment itself um, a little more effective. And so I'm going to turn this back over to Hillary for a few minutes, and she's going to tell you a little bit about that work, because I think it's a great example of how you can take you know, important key information and turn it into really effective messaging. Great, thanks, Aaron. So as, as I mentioned, we started working on sea level rise in 2014 and 2015 was when we received funds to work on the vulnerability assessment and started uh, a lot of public outreach and engagement around sea level rise. And then this led to the development of the final report in 2018 for the vulnerability assessment. And we did quite a bit of work with different firms, communication, um, specialist to think about how do you take this subject, which is uh, can be overwhelming and um, paralyzing in some aspects and uh, motivate action. So we worked with frameworks uh, who's based on the East Coast, who's done a lot of research, science-based research on how do you take climate change and other science topics and move people to action. And based on that work, we actually made a lot of significant changes to our, our sea change website and to some of the documents that we produced as a result of the vulnerability assessment, like our highlights document. And um, we learned about rather than uh, starting with the problem, starting with people's values and um, not as focusing as much on, on some of the, the bit, the, uh, different aspects that can make the problem a little bit overwhelming. Um, so we did make some significant changes to how we were communicating about sea level rise and those are in line with um, the training today. Great, well, I think that's a great example of the kind of work that we're doing today and why it's important. Uh, so let's start talking about you know messaging in general. I think all of us have a tendency to do what I call dump trucking information. Um, when it comes to climate change, when it comes to sea level rise, you know, these are really important issues. They're issues that affect all of us. They're issues that are urgent, that need our attention. They're issues that demand that we change a lot of things about the way we live our lives. And there seem to be a lot of people who don't understand that or who aren't acting as urgently as they should be about it. There seems to be a lot of societal change that is not happening. So there's a tendency when we start to message this information, we do what's called dump trucking. You know, we're feeling 
really kind of panicked and freaked out and worried about this stuff. You know, we see what's coming, we see what's happening, and we really want to communicate that urgency um, and the fact that, you know, we really need to change. And so we kind of want to just like grab people and shake them and say, hey, look at this information. And we want to convince them by giving them the true information. We think that the problem is that they don't understand, you know, they don't have the information. And this approach is really based on, you know, something called the information fallacy. It's the belief that we all have deep inside of us that information is alone is enough to change hearts, minds, and actions. However, that's not actually true. It is true that knowledge is one of the key components you need um, when reaching people, but on its own, it won't necessarily have the desired impact. And as a matter of fact, if someone is convinced of something and you try to give them information that contradicts their point of view in order to convince them otherwise, oftentimes it can be counterproductive. Oftentimes you can actually, they can become more entrenched in this position. And the reason is because people aren't blank slates. We all come to the table with our own prior experiences and we reference those prior experiences when we're learning about new information. So the way that we tell a story, the way that we convey information triggers responses inside of other people. And based on other people's pre-existing beliefs and their what are called biases, you know, they can react in a number of, of different ways. They might, you know, uh, they might take in the information and believe it. Uh, they might kind of modify it internally or they might reject it outright. So that's not a very effective way of communicating. What we really want to do is we want communication, education and outreach approaches that lead to a number of things. We want better listening and understanding. We want more openness to new perspectives and information. We want more insightful thinking and conversations, right? We want more supportive beliefs and attitudes. And at the end of the day, ultimately, we, what we want is for people to make better choices. Now, when we talk about better choices, this is kind of the whole gamut of everything from individual behavior change and adopting new behaviors, all the way up to social change, social movements, things like that. And that's a very heavy lift. You know, actually, if you've ever worked in the behavior change field or tried to get people to do something different, you can know that it's really, really difficult to, impossible to do sometimes, it feels like. Um, so I like to think about our communication, our engagement as a puzzle pieces, right? An individual communication touch will probably not change someone's mind and change their behaviors, right? However, if you make your communication, your message as effective as possible, you're going to be a bigger part of the puzzle because it may be true that someone hears your message and then maybe they talk to their neighbor and then maybe they talk to a friend of theirs and then maybe they read a blog post and then maybe they hear a webinar and eventually they come around to a new way of thinking and eventually a new way of acting. And so our role as communicators is to make sure that we're making our message as effective as possible so we can be the largest puzzle piece possible. I also think about communication and messaging in another very simple way. Um, if we're dump trucking information, and this is a you know image, here's you and you're just conveying information. Uh, you're dump trucking it on your audience. And if that's all you're doing, as I said, you know, that's not a very effective way to create change. What you really want to do is you want to not only convey information, but you want to convey meaning along with your information. And when I say meaning, I, I mean meaning that has a connection and, a, and is meaningful to your exact audience. So if you can transmit both information and meaning, then you're going to have a much more effective message. And so I think about every time I'm crafting a message, I think about, am I just sending across information or am I, do I have meaning behind it that is meaningful for my audience? And if I do that well, then the result can be learning, engagement, support and participation from your audience rather than just sort of glazing over, not really paying attention, rejecting what you're saying or kind of modifying it internally. Before I get into the specifics of the framework, which we're going to be training on today, I wanted to say a few things about urgency, because I think this is a really big, difficult topic for people when it comes to climate and sea level rise. Um, you know, the information, the science on, and the impacts of sea level rise and climate change are serious, right? We're starting to see them in our daily lives. We're starting to see them in our communities um, and they're scary. Um, and the science out there is there's some pretty, pretty serious stuff going on. And I think for a long time, there was a tendency within sort of the climate change communication community 
to shy away from the seriousness and the urgency of the situation because we didn't want to turn people off. We didn't want to shut them down. But there's kind of a new way of thinking which says that, you know, we don't want to downplay what's happening. We want to be honest with people. We need to be realistic about the fact that we have set certain changes in motion, that the future is going to be different than the past. And in some ways, it's going to be much, much more difficult. However, that doesn't mean that things are hopeless. It doesn't mean that the choices we make today don't impact our future tomorrow. As a matter of fact, the opposite is true. So although we should be honest with people about the seriousness and the urgency of sea level rise, we don't want to kind of drop them off a, off a pit of despair with no recourse but to give up, right? We want to inspire concern and urgency, not fear. And one of the best ways to do that is to give people agency, right? There have been numerous studies that have shown how important it is if you want people to change or to act differently, to reinforce that their actions can make a difference. And this is especially true on a collective level because these are collective problems and by and large, they demand collective solutions. So I would say that one of the most important things you can do in your messaging is to give people the message that what they do matters and what they do together especially matters and kind of help paint a picture of a more positive future. You know, it may not be a perfect future. It may have a lot of challenges, but we can decide what it looks like. So I am uh, in a few minutes going to get into the exact framework and the, the training, but I did want to share one success story that I think you guys will appreciate. So there is a program that I was involved in. It's called the National Network on Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation, which is uh, Nyoki. It's kind of a mouthful, and we, we never really knew whether to pronounce it Noki or Nyaki or Nochi. We never really figured that out. But it was a really great program that I was involved in. Uh, it involved 184 different zoos, aquariums, and cultural institutions in 38 states. And this program basically trained zoo and aquarium and nature center professionals on using a framework very similar to what we're going to be doing today. And the whole program was based on training interpreters. So interpreters are the kind of people who do, if you ever go to the California Academy of Sciences or the zoo and you've got someone up there talking about the animals and then they make a connection between the animals and, you know, biodiversity loss or climate change or, you know, uh, ecosystem conservation, those are interpreters. Um, and many years ago, there was a pretty common understanding that climate change was a very scary subject. It was a very important subject. And interpreters were reporting that they did not know how to message climate change effectively. You know, they were sitting in front of millions of people uh, around the country, and they weren't doing a good job of talking about climate and climate solutions. And so this program was put together to use some of the, this, this, this framework approaches to messaging more effectively. And through a long process over many years, it trained several hundred interpreters on how to message climate change more effectively. Um, it occurred in places like this. this is a picture of the aquarium tank at the, you know, the California Academy of Sciences, but it, it occurred across the country. And these interpreters, you know, between them touched tens of millions of people every single year and got the message out. And as the program went on, they did some evaluation of the program's input and impact. And the results were really quite astounding. So the study concluded that Noki training was successful in promoting more effective climate communication among climate interpreters and as a result, increased visitor engagement. Regardless of political ideology and education, educators saw significant increases in understanding, hope, and intentions to act. So that's really good news. I mean, as far as a single touch kind of messaging experience goes, you could not ask for more than that. It's really impressive results. And all because of the fact that these communicators changed the way that they message this issue. It didn't make the, the issue any less scary or any less concerning. Um, it didn't change their audiences, but they had a much bigger impact, positive impact by just changing the way they spoke about it. So that's a great example of, you know, how this kind of, these kinds of approaches and this kind of framework can work and really kind of boost your effectiveness. Um, there is kind of an added bonus with this program is, you know, as I said, one of the things that happened was the communicators were not confident about talking about climate change and they were very worried about encountering climate denial in their programs and not sure how to how to deal with that however all of the noki participants reported an increase in their confidence and ability to explain and there an increase in the confidence of visitor interest and a decrease in concern and hostility so this kind of thing can not only boost you know how you're doing your job and how it's affecting your audiences but how you feel about your job and how you perform your job yourself so it's very powerful So let's go ahead and 
talk about the framework which we're going to use today to do the framing. Um, as was mentioned, this is part of the San Mateo Sea Level Rise Toolkit. This is a very detailed toolkit that we put together, a catalyst for San Mateo. You are all going to be receiving an electronic copy of that toolkit um, after the training. And this training is really an abridged version of what is in the toolkit. That toolkit is very detailed, um, has many more steps in it because it's much longer. And the reality is that you can spend a long time working on training through these types of techniques. It can take a lot of energy. It takes practice, practice, practice. So we really encourage you to take what you learn in the training today, to put it into practice, uh, to work with your colleagues, to you know, uh, play with it over and over and keep practicing on it, but also take a look at the, the toolkit, which has a lot more details and some more resources for you as well. Um, all of these approaches are evidence-based, meaning they've been, they've been used and studied and researched, uh, which is why we know that they work. Um, and I just encourage you to learn as much as you can about this framework and other types of, you know, of communication frameworks to improve the way that you're getting your message out to your audiences. We really want to use these tools to kind of bridge the gap between these issues, sea level rise, and the community members and locals who are affected by it. There's this large gap in understanding. There's a large gap in uh, understanding how it matters to them and there's a large gap in them understanding what they can do to help you know adopt solutions so these tools will help bridge that gap so in the framework today um, there are three basic parts of this framework um, number one is to start with shared values as the foundation of your message and i'll explain why how those work and why those are really important uh, the second part of the process is to make the problem understandable and locally relevant um, and the third is to present actions and solutions. Um, now, before I go into all of these details, one of the things I'm curious about is I'm guessing that some people in the audience have had some communication uh, training in terms of climate change and sea level rise possibly, or maybe you have a great communication story um, that you can share with the group. So what I'm gonna do is I'd love you guys in the chat to maybe give some examples of some training you've had, some experiences you've had uh, where you kind of fine tuned your, your messages and your, your communication to make it more effective. So feel free to just throw some stuff into the chat. So I, it is possible that no one's had any kind of experience of this type of education, um, this kind of training, and that's great. That's why we're all here. Um, so let's get into the details then. One second here while Zoom catches up. Sometimes it gets a little laggy here, and I have to push the button a few times to make it jump to the next slide. Okay, there we go. So let's talk about shared values. Um, you know, values connect much more deeply than facts and figures. Um, they're very, very powerful tools when it comes to communicating with people. Um, as was mentioned before, the Frameworks Institute is an organization which does a lot of engagement um, research and has worked on a lot of different social and environmental programs to learn how to make communication more effective. Um, and they've confirmed that the most effective way to open a conversation about sea level rise is to start with universal shared values. And one way to think about it is, you know, you know, starting with values is a way to get everyone on the same page from the very beginning of a conversation. And I'd like to kind of share a little story that I have that really sort of cemented for me how important values were. I think it was in my first year or two at the California Academy of Science, uh, Sciences, and uh, the head of our public programs was doing a was doing a program on solar um, solar technology. And he had an audience in front of him and he was talking about the benefits of it. And when he mentioned climate change, there was a gentleman in the back who quite loudly yelled that climate change wasn't real. Um, and he kind of stopped. And I was very interested to see how we'd handle this because, I, you know, you don't want to get in, into a fight. You don't want to try to talk someone out of their beliefs. That's not going to be effective. It's counterproductive. So what he did was something very intelligent. He stopped for a second. He paused and he said, OK, it is possible that you and I cannot agree on whether or not climate change is real. However, surely we can agree that in America, we should be adopting new, cleaner, more efficient technologies that will grow our economy and create jobs. 
And the guy at the back kind of paused and he said, yeah, I guess that's right. And to me, that was sort of this light bulb coming on moment, which is, you know, you're not trying to talk people out of certain things. You're not trying to tell them that they're wrong. What you want to do with values is kind of start a conversation where you're all in the same place. And I think it's less likely you'll be dealing with a lot of climate and sea level rise denial in your communities where you work. But at the end of the day, you want everyone to start from the same place. And another kind of simple test you can use when you think about, am I using a value effectively, is if you say your value statement to yourself yourself and you say, wow, no reasonable person could disagree with that, right? That's just that's just such a reasonable thing that the vast majority of people are going to agree with it. That means that you're using the values correctly. And so one of the great things about this training and about the research that's been done is there has been a lot of um, work done to decide to define what are good shared universal values. And there are four of them, which we're uh, gonna be training you on today. Um, they're responsible management, protection, interconnectedness, which is kind of a mouthful, and innovation. And what I mean when these are shared universal values is all the research shows that the vast majority of people hold these values inside of them and agree with them. And it means that they are receptive to messages that contain these values. They're more receptive than they would be otherwise if you did not use them. So let's go through and talk a little bit about each of these values. The first one is protection. And the basic definition of it is we must protect people and places from harm. Now, this is probably the most powerful value of all the four that we've placed. It's the one that kind of, in terms of surveys and research, uh, tends to uh, connect most strongly with most people. Um, and I know this seems like kind of an abstract concept. I'm talking about values. So let me give you, I'm going to give you some examples of what messaging using these values might be like. So this is an example of a couple of messages that use protection as the value. Uh, the first one is we should protect our communities uh, from the dangers of increased storm surge. It's very simple. Um, second one is with rising sea levels and more extreme weather, we, may, we also need to take steps to safeguard San Mateo County from flooding and erosion. Um, so you'll notice here that I didn't actually use the word protect, the word is safeguard, but it's kind of the same concept. So you don't necessarily need to use these exact words, although you can and they're effective, but sometimes you're kind of use, uh, saying things in your own voice or your own kind of your own, um, using your own words, but they mean the same thing and they have the same impact. So that's the, what a protection message might look like if you were going to add it into something that you're trying to communicate to people. Uh, let's take a look at the second message, uh, second value, it's responsible management, and it just means taking practical, common sense steps to address problems facing our communities today is in the best interest of future generations, right? One of the things about this value is great is it is a great way to talk about our collective duty to care for our environment. Um, it's also a great way to sort of counter climate denialism frames by suppressing the notion that concern for the environment is a radical or fringe position, because this is all about common sense, right? It just makes sense that we take care of our infrastructure, of our environment, of our people. Um, so what might a responsible management message look like? Let's take a look at some examples here. So here's one. We can make a difference by improving our coastal infrastructure before it is damaged by rising sea levels. And then the other one is, we believe in being responsible with our facilities and natural resources. Now, I just want to mention that the reason that I'm giving you examples of these is that later on in our breakout groups, we're going to be asking you guys to create some scenarios and actually craft some messaging using these, these values as well. So just you know, make sure that you're getting the concept here. If you have any questions, we can talk about it. Uh, but that's the whole point, is that you'll be able to take these values and use them in your own communications. Uh, the third value is interconnectedness. So water, land, human activities, and our extensive infrastructure are all connected. And, you know, in San Mateo, what that might look like here is, you know, we are all affected throughout the county when roadways and neighborhoods flood and erode as a result of sea level rise. And then here's another one. As natural conditions become less predictable because of climate change, our community safety becomes harder to ensure. So what you're really trying to do is you're trying to connect nature to people um, and to our infrastructure and our technology and our society and everything that we care about in life, it's all connected together. And so when there are impacts to one, it impacts all of them. And that's really the message that we're trying to get across through this value. 
And the last value, which is quite popular here uh, in San Mateo is innovation. You know, the idea that we can be resourceful, clever, and thoughtful to solve problems and generate new ideas. Now, a little bit about innovation. Obviously, this area is a hotbed of innovation. You know, um, it's a source of pride and great progress. Uh, you know, you have the tech community here. You have a lot of people who have very innovative minds and very innovative jobs. However, I want to uh, suggest that innovation is not just about new technology. You know, dealing with sea level rise and climate change are going to demand that we not only innovate new technologies, but we need to innovate new funding mechanisms, new social structures, uh, new ways of governing. So when we talk about innovation, it's not just technology, it's social, it's financial, it's cultural as well. And I think it's important to keep that in mind is because we don't want to use this value to message to people that, hey, you know, science is going to save us. Somebody is going to create the perfect carbon capture technology or the perfect seawall. And all of a sudden, none of us need to change anything. We're, we're just going to sit back and let the, let the researchers and scientists and innovators invent the technology. And we're going to be fine because that's not what we want to get across with this. What we want to get across is that, yes, innovation is, is a huge part of what we need to do to solve these problems. And we need to work together and we need to think about it across the spectrum. So here are some examples of some innovation uh, some messages. Schools and businesses and local governments across the county are already thinking of innovative ways to protect our shorelines and communities and reduce our burning of fossil fuels. And here's another one. It's time to phase out old technologies and practices that contribute to sea level rise and start supporting energy innovations that benefit both our ecosystems and our economy. So that's what innovation messages might look like. So when you're using messages, here's a couple you know, important tips. The first one is, you know, I just uh, gave you four examples of sort of values that have been tested and been proven to be very universal and universally accepted and universally effective. It is important that you don't try to sort of go off the cup and use and make up your own values because you, unless you are familiar with the research behind them, they can often have unintended consequences or backfire or not nearly be not nearly as effective. So kind of stick to these four, you know, one of these four values or maybe a couple of them at, at the same time in a message. Um, and we're gonna practice that in our breakout groups. Uh, you want to maintain a reasonable tone. It's really important that you use these values. You don't come off as radical or angry or upset or um, super fringe. You know, you want to, you know, these values can kind of put everyone on the same page. And one of the best ways to maintain that is to come off as a reasonable person. No matter how scary this stuff is, no matter how upset you are about it, we can get across urgency, we can get across importance without um, appearing really upset and really sort of radical, because that's going to turn off some of your audience. Uh, use values to prime a civic mindset. They often say that, you know, Americans think of themselves more as consumers uh, rather than citizens. And um, I think we can use values to kind of reset that a little bit so people see themselves more in kind of a civic citizen mindset. Um, and the whole reason we're using values is because we feel the urge to get people to care. Um, and values are a great way of connecting us all together emotionally um, so that we're all in the same space about how important these issues are. So that's the situation with values. Um, the next piece of the framework, uh, which I wanna introduce is how to make your message local and relevant. This is really important. You know, if you are talking to people about sea level rise or any other climate issue, you know, your audience, they need to see a connection. They need to see it under local familiar conditions and they need to see themselves within the context of the message that you're trying to get across. So remember that when you're messaging, it's about your audience. It's about them. It's about the things they care about, which are themselves, their families, their communities, their tribes, right? It's not about faraway people in faraway places. Um, the more personal you can make your messages, the more powerful they are. So for instance, if you are writing a press release, you might need to make it somewhat general because you're going out to a wide and diverse audience. Um, if you are speaking to a room full of people, you know, all from the same neighborhood, you can probably make a message even more local and relevant to them. And if you're having a one on one conversation, think about what the person in front of you, who they are, where they are and what they care about. So, you know, the more personal, the better. One of the greatest examples of a failure to do this is 
early climate change messaging that went on for decades, I don't see it nearly as much anymore, but it's still somewhat prevalent. And I feel like it was a bit of a disaster and wasted a lot of really important time in terms of coming to grips and adopting solutions about climate change. Is for a long time, if you got a group of people in an audience and you said, if you think about climate change or global warming, what's the number one thing that comes to your mind? Every single person would raise their hand and they would say melting ice caps and polar bears, right? This was kind of the, the polar bear was kind of the mascot for climate change. And over the years, researchers did a lot of polling and they grew to understand that yes, people may care about polar bears. They think they're amazing animals. They care about the ecosystems they live in and they somewhat care about the ice caps melting, but nobody lives near polar bears or very few people. Um, and so this is almost a disincentive to act because what you're saying is these are far away impacts in far away places for future generations. And instead of making it local and approachable, they were sort of taking the opposite approach. And it was a, a bit of a, like a kind of a waste of all of this opportunity to get people engaged on a local level much earlier in the process. Um, so you wanna avoid doing that. So one of the best ways to make things local or approachable is to talk about local impacts. Um, so I'm gonna go through a series of slides here and what they're gonna do is they're examples of messaging that talk about four of the types of impacts you get from sea level rise. They've also got photos here from local areas um, and some messages associated. And these are just examples of the ways you might make this issue local and approachable by talking about local impacts. So the first one is flooding, right? That's the most well-known impact of, of rising sea levels. Uh, and met, one of the messages might be, many of San Mateo's most beloved public spaces are on the coast and vulnerable to flooding from sea level rise. And incidentally, you'll see that I'm using some photos here. You know, messages can be visual as well as verbal, as well as the written word. And if you're gonna be using images or videos, one of the most important things is try as much as you can to put people into those photos as much as you can try and put your audience into those photos because when you're showing photos of just landscapes or impacts without people people have a hard time associating that as relevant to them so just like with your words just like with your messages if you're going to use visuals make them make them personal and local as well another important impact of sea level rise is erosion right the eating away of, of cliffs and coastal areas and this is a great example of this photo here um, and a message might be sea level rise is accelerating coastal erosion, affecting what we love about living here in San Mateo. The next one, uh, next impact is infrastructure damage. So rising water levels can damage our roads, water and sewer systems and power infrastructure. And then the fourth impact, um, storm surge and sea level rise Sea level rise is contributing to much stronger storm surge during extreme weather events. Um, so those are kind of sample messages using kind of four types of impacts from sea level rise. And one of the things that's interesting is I'm not a San Mateo resident, but all of these photos come from local areas. And I'm actually gonna ask Hillary to chime in here. You know, sh she's a local and she's got some interesting stories to tell about the impacts and some of the steps they've taken to mitigate these. Thanks, Aaron, this has been great so far. So we wanted to take a moment and just explain some of the efforts that are underway in these photos. And I'm, I'm sure these places are familiar to those of you on the call. So we showed photos of the Pescadero Road flooding during a rain event, um, Pacifica erosion and Marotta Road uh, in Half Moon Bay, just south of Surfers Beach and East Palo Alto. And these are areas where there's a number of efforts already underway or implemented to address sea level rise. And as I mentioned in my opening, we're really fortunate to have the Flood and Resilience Civil Rights District dedicated to taking multi-jurisdictional action in a lot of these areas. And I thought I would talk about a couple examples. Uh, the Pescadero area, we've actually been working to complete the vulnerability assessment in this area uh, from south of Half Moon Bay to the county border and are looking at um, combined flood risk in that area. Uh, to think about what types of solutions we could put in place to address the flooding that happens. And there's been a number of efforts already in, in place looking at the marsh um, and sediment in that area to address flooding of the road. And another example is Marotta Road. Um, that's an area where erosion is definitely a concern. Um, and the one shoreline, the Flood and Resilience District is partnering with the county and the San Mateo County 
Harbor District to look at that area from the Pillar Point Harbor down to Murata Road to look at what types of solutions can we put in place to address erosion and, and help protect a lot of the, the beaches and the infrastructure in that area. So th those are a couple examples and we're looking forward to talking more about local examples and solutions and messaging in the breakout rooms. I'll turn it back over to Aaron. Great, thanks so much, Hillary. That's all really fascinating. It's interesting to see all the, the way that the community is coming together to address some of these issues. Um, and speaking of solutions, um, the third piece of this framework that we want to talk about, the third piece of the puzzle that you want to inject into your message is a focus on solutions. Now, why do we want to do that? Um, you know, one of the reasons is we want to avoid people dropping people off that pit of despair I'm talking about, right? We want to give them a sense of agency, a sense that what they do individually or collectively can make a difference. Um, we want to offer them a sense of community. Um, you know, a local activist that I'm, you know, work with sometimes, she's fond of saying that when she feels the most low or the most depressed or the more ups most upset about local politics or local environmental issues, what she does is she goes and does more volunteer work with other people who care as much as she do and are working to solve the issue. And I think that's very wise because, you know, as we, you know, form a sense of community and gather together to work on these issues, we actually feel better about things and we feel a more powerful sense of agency. Um, so I think it's really important, you know, you can focus on individual solutions a little bit, but I would really suggest that the focus should be on collective solutions. Again, these are collective problems. They demand big, wide-scale, transformative solutions, and we can only do that by working together. So whenever you're talking about solutions, you want to think bigger. Always think about how can you keep it local, but think bigger. Um, you know, I would say that you should just suggest a specific action to take or an initiative to throw your audience to throw their support behind you know, trying to make it as specific as possible rather than saying we should all get together and work on this, say we should all get together and then spell out specifically how we can work on this together, you know, gives people something, you know, exact to do. Um, and just, you know, part of the, the benefit of this is, you know, as you're picking local solutions, um, it's another great way to make this issue local and relevant. It's another way to great, make your message more personal for people. So when we're talking about solutions, you know, I put together a slide of potential solutions that people might do here in San Mateo. Um, you know, I don't want to read these all word by word, but it's things like, you know, everything from, you know, playing a game of fledge with your coworkers, volunteering for a local organization, participating in one shoreline sea level rise adaptation infrastructure projects, subscribing to a newsletter, um, organizing your neighborhood for storm emergencies, you know, working with neighbors to develop strategies to protect infrastructure, um, and implementing large-scale wetlands or regional shoreline protection projects. Now, something you will notice about this list of potential, you know, calls to action or solutions is that there's a very broad spectrum. There's different scales, there's different timelines, different levels of complexity, different costs. And the most important thing about if you're going to be creating a call to action or you know, recommending a solution in your message, what matters most is who is your audience? Where are they coming from? What matters to them? Uh, what are you trying to accomplish? Um, you know, and what is possible? What, is, what can you ask people to do that is something that they can actually you know, get behind and actually take part in? So these are just some ideas that I put together for solutions, but I know that all of you, you know, you work in San Mateo, you live in San Mateo, and I would love to hear some suggestions from you right now in the chat about other suggestions you might have for ways that, you know, you might incorporate calls to action or solutions into your own messages. And we're going to be doing a, a bit of this later on in our breakout groups, but I'd love to hear from you now with just some ideas. So feel free to throw them out in the chat room. Partnering with local agency, working on sea level rise, right? Great. Ask residents to share their personal stories about dealing with flooding to share in our newsletters. That's awesome. Great way to make it personal and you know use storytelling as a tool. Engage in private sector 
funding projects to protect against sea level rise. Awesome, funding is always a big issue. Feel free to keep them coming. Because these will be actually be helpful for us as we move into our breakout groups. Oh, this is great. I challenge students to notice more now that they know more. Next time it rains, where does the water go? Imagine a flood now, that kind of thing. I love it. Somebody's obviously a teacher. Okay, let's do one more. Help people visualize sea level rise by posting signs or other markers showing where the water will be in X number of years. Exactly. So they, making it visual is always, always a great idea. Okay, so you can feel free to keep adding them. We're gonna do some more of this specific work in our exercises in our breakout groups, but I really appreciate, appreciate the input there. I have to wait here for, sometimes Zoom freezes for a second here when I use my chat, so I have to push the button a few times to get it to forward a slide. Just give me a second here. There we go. Okay. All right, so now that we've talked about this framework and about messaging, let's go back to the very first message that we had at the very beginning of this presentation. So this is the first message, you know, lots of facts and figures, lots of important information, but maybe not tailored in the most effective way unless you're talking to someone, you know, a planner or an engineer. So what might we take this message and turn it into? Something that's a little bit more effective if you're talking to a more general audience. And I'm gonna say that this is, this is one example of what you might turn a message into. So sea level rise affects all of us in San Mateo County. A flooded highway, wastewater treatment plant, or electrical substation could temporarily shut down businesses, close roads, and affect neighborhoods and households throughout the county. There are solutions we can take to reduce these community level risks. By working together, we can protect our neighborhoods, businesses, parks, and beaches, places that we all love. We need to work with other jurisdictions to identify and prioritize city scale and regional shoreline protection measures. So this is a longer message, um, but you know what I see in here? I see some values. Do you guys see the values in there? And I actually see two of them. And again, I said, it's, it's okay to add, sometimes you use a, a combination of values in your messages, but the, the two values that I see are, uh, I see interconnectedness, and I also see protection in there. And what else I see is that both in terms of describing the problem and the impact and also describing solutions, there is, you know, this message makes everything local and relevant as well. So this is a great example of turning kind of a very wonky information laden message into something that may have a lot less facts and figures and maybe the analytical side of us says, but that's not getting the information across. But the important thing is what this message is doing is getting the meaning across. And it's attempting to connect with the audience in a way so that the message matters to them. And that's the whole point of all of this reframing, all of this training that we're going through today. All right, so what I wanna do now is uh, we're gonna start our breakout groups at 11. It's, uh, so we have about maybe five or 10 minutes uh, for some questions. And so I wanted to give you an opportunity uh, to uh, enter questions into the chat. Um, so we can take a couple of those if you wanna go ahead and put them out. Uh, I have a question, Aaron. Yes. I you know it's not my role, but too curious. Um, thinking of that scenario that you talked about earlier where there was like a climate change denier in the audience, I was wondering if you feel like one value over the others has like that short term, like I only get to interact with this person once in this group setting, What what's best? Well, the research says that the protection value, you know, like, you know, the idea of protecting ourselves, protecting our families, protecting our communities, protecting our country, you know, depending on the audience and the, the, the scope that you're talking about is the most kind of common shared uh, value. So you can't really go wrong with protection. However, um, you know, uh, the 
all of the others can work depending on the situation and who you're talking to. They're all pretty universal. They're sort of bipartisan values, if you will. So, you know, if, when you use carefully, they should appeal to the vast majority of your audience. Um, as I said, again, you know, in the Bay Area, we tend, and in this day and age, as climate change becomes more accepted by more people, we tend to deal with less and less denial, outright denial, which is nice because it's, it's scary for people, right? It's very difficult. Um, but, you know, always think about, you know, where your audience is and what kind of value can bring you all together from the starting point. Um, also, we can ask people to raise their hand and, you know, instead of typing it into the chat room, they can, you know, they can go ahead and be called on and, and speak, you know, on camera uh, or just, you know, through the microphone. That's fine as well. That's probably easier and more friendly than using the chat. I see that only hand raised. Hi, thank you, Erin. This has been really helpful so far. Um, I work with schools in the county, and I think what happens most often for me is that schools will agree that sea level rise is an important issue, but they don't feel empowered to take action. And often the solutions for them are not don't feel as accessible. So I was wondering just how um, if you could help me make that how these values would can, how would you respond to that kind of concern from a school district leader like maybe they say like oh well it's just, it's not our priority right our priority is teaching um but then you know I'm, i would be trying to help them understand that you know our, we're not going to be able to teach when we have sea level rise affecting so many of our communities here locally so yeah just curious um about that issue Right. So I think you, you know, it's kind of two parts to your question. One is sort of how, how do you use values? Um, and sort of also, how do you talk about solutions when you're dealing with, and I'm guessing you're talking talk about younger children, especially um, in, in schools that have younger populations. But I think you did a great job. The first, I think one of the answers is, you know, interconnectedness is, you know, as sea level rise affects everything in our community, it's going to affect everyone in our community. It's going to affect, you know, for children, it's going to affect their school, uh, the funding, the infrastructure, um, you know, facilities. It's going to affect their parents and their parents' roles and their parents' jobs. It's going to affect local economies. So, you know, there are a lot of ways to make, you use interconnectedness to make this, to kind of set the stage to say this matters to everyone, this issue matters to everyone. It may not, you know, your school may not be in danger of flooding right now, but it relies on infrastructure that is in danger of flooding or inundation from salt water, say, or from extreme storm events. So you can use that value to just kind of reinforce that. Um, and the second thing in terms of solutions is, depending on the age of the, the kids you're talking about, if they're high school kids, you can probably, you know, I would say that what we really want to do, young people today do tend to be you know, more empowered and politically active than past generations. They're seeing sort of the future they're inheriting. They're seeing um, the kind of impacts um, and they don't want to inherit a world like this and they want to get to work on these issues. So, you know, if they're older, you can really sort of propose that they get together and start to organize and start to find their sense of agency. And, you know, where are the areas that they can make a difference? Can they start, you know, a, can they start some kind of, can they start a petition? Can they start a local, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, drive, uh, equipment drive, or can they get involved in local politics? Can they come to meetings? If it's younger children, I think the thing to do is to really say, to, you know, reinforce the idea that, you know, these are, you know, you don't want to scare kids. Obviously, you want to be careful about how you message this stuff to them, but you want to reinforce the fact that we're all in this together and we can all band together and make a difference and we're all a community. So reinforce that sense of community. But it really depends on kind of the, the type of students and the type of school you're talking about. But I think that's a great question. And Naomi, I would add also, if, if it's about the administrators or the teachers, enlisting their involvement and support in things is obviously a, a step with that level is, um, uh, you know, helping them think through how they could teach about sea level rise or enlisting their support in um, the local government efforts to uh, prevent flooding or, you know, that that there's a there's a civic minded aspect of school administrators, teachers, et cetera. And there's I mean, this subject is so broad. There's there's lots of opportunities for them to to join in the solutions. And and that's a little bit about kind of that, that third step is thinking through what are the solutions that are relevant for this audience. So 
Um, so I think at that level, there, there are things that you can engage them. It's not their primary thing, but they can offer support in a variety of different ways. Um, I had a, uh, thanks Charles for kind of uh, getting to the heart of that question. Um, I have a, a comment here uh, from Margaret Bruce. It says sea level rise resiliency projects require many years and huge sums of money. The scale is difficult to communicate and to understand, especially in an era when most people have instant gratification habits. How do you recommend communicating the need for the effort and also, and also the long, long time scale of these projects? So this is one of the most challenging ones because human beings biologically have a certain tendency um, to look at short-term short -term impacts and short-term dangers and give them more weight than long-term ones, right? We are sort of genetically designed to deal with, you know, immediate threats to our survival, not necessarily long-term challenges. And that's one of the problems with climate change is it's a long-term slow moving, you know, it has been a long-term slow moving issue, although the impacts are starting to move more and more fast, quickly. So I think when it comes to communicating, I think that, you know, the, it does come back again to starting with the values, which are this interconnectedness, which is, yes, um, if we don't do this stuff, these are going to be the impacts. I think we need to be realistic and honest with people that, and say, you know, we may want to put off this. We may not want to spend this money because we're not going to get instant gratification. We're, we may not see the results for another year or two or five. But if we don't start doing this stuff now, it's going to be impossible or even more expensive to do later. And again, this, you know, as with all messaging, you know, you may not convince somebody, you know, through a conversation or through a press release or through, you know, a, a blog post that you write. But what we all want to do is be one of those pieces of the puzzle. And if we all get together and make our messaging more effectively over time, we'll start to create the social cohesion and change that we need to see. Yeah, and I would add, you know, Margaret obviously is working on that, that core value of the protection, right? I mean, that's, that's the nature of those projects is that they're about protection. Um, but I think some of the other values, the responsible management one is a great one to add of uh, that I think that fundamentally does relate to that longer term nature. And uh, so it's connecting of like, yes, this is, res this is re the responsible thing to do is to plan and invest uh, in these solutions for the future. And um, again, that's that's a, a, a secondary or a second value that can supplement what you're obviously already doing, the core protection thing. So um, and it can help bridge to that longer term planning, funding need um, uh, and communicating that. Great. Um, do we have more questions at the moment? Feel free to raise your hand or throw them in the chat. Yeah, I think that, the, I mean, clearly in this in the whole arena, the funding issue was really, really um, important. And and how do how do you open that that question? And and again, I think the the responsible management value is 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 really an important one uh, on these kind of bigger longer term solutions and uh, and connecting with people on that that it's as it, this is a sensible thing to do we need to work on it we don't have all the answers yet but we've got to start now um, it's an important part of the messaging particularly when it relates to these big expensive long-term things All right. Um, so thank you. Those are great questions. Um, so now we're going to I'm going to move into some instructions about the exercise that we're going to go through uh, during our breakout groups. So I call this putting it all together. And basically what we're going to be asking you to do in your breakout groups is some to envision some scenarios and then designing some messages using the framework, which I just presented on uh, prior. So when you think about the different pieces of this exercise, there's a number of them. Um, the first step is going to be articulating the situation. And by that, I mean, you know, when you're thinking about a message, try to invent or possibly come up or think about 
a context or a situation which you are facing in your, your daily life or in your job situation. So maybe you're a teacher who's trying to talk to your students. Maybe you're you know someone working in an agency and you're trying to write a blog post. Maybe you're giving an interview uh, to a local news station. So first of all, come up with a scenario, articulate the situation. Uh, the second step is with that situation in mind is to define your audience. And by that, I mean, think about who you're talking to, whether it's an individual person or a group of people or, you know, a, you know, a citywide audience. Um, and also, as you define your audience, think about are there one or two key things we know about this audience that can help us as we write a message to them? You know, where do they come from? What do they care about? Who are they? Um, you know, just think about what do we know about this audience that may help us kind of fine tune our message to them. Um, and then in step three, you're going to decide on a value or values that you want to use to kind of use as the foundation for your message. Um, again, all of this information, all, all of this exercise, all the instructions are in the worksheet that you were all emailed uh, yesterday, last night. Um, so hopefully you all have a copy of it. If you don't, we can email it to you again. But we're going to use these worksheets to kind of fill in the blanks and create our messages. So you, you know, you pick a value. Um, step four is making the problem understandable and locally relevant. And by this, we mean we are going to pick one of the four sea level rise impacts, which we spoke about earlier. Um, so you're going to use one of those as part of the part of your message. And then five is you're going to decide on what are the calls to actions or solutions that you want to um, to use in this message that you want to suggest that people take up or use or support. Um, and by with all these pieces of the puzzle, the hope is that we can get together in our breaker groups and actually practice using this framework to create some messages. So you want to combine all of them together into you know, an effective, concise, compelling message for your audience. Um, one of the things that I really want to reinforce is don't be afraid to make these messages your own. Um, they may sound different if it's in a press release versus a conversation uh, versus an interview. Um, if you've done any writing or communicating before, you know, don't be afraid to use your own voice. Try to make these messages sound as natural as possible. Sometimes when we do this, I know I have a tendency, I write things and they come off sounding super, you know, wonky um, at first and I have to kind of work on them over and over again. But the more you practice with this, the more you're able to kind of express things in your own voice um, and it sounds natural to you and it sounds natural to your audience. And as with every message, ask yourself, you know, once you, once you write your first draft of it, think, you know, am I getting across meaning as well as information? Am I doing a good job of connecting with my audience and making them feel a part of this message? Um, so here's the basic uh, here's the basic format. Um, next steps is we're going to break out into a number of groups, um, and then we're going to reconvene at 1140 for kind of a group share out. So in order to make that happen, uh, I, think mean, you know, I think we mean 1040. Oh, 1040. Oh, sorry. Yes, that's a that's a typo. 1040. You guys aren't you're not you're not um, required to stay for another two hours. Um, each group's going to have a facilitator. Um, in your group, I'd love it if you could try and craft at least two messages, uh, maybe more if things are going well, but try and do at least two. You know, all the instructions are in the, um, the, the sheets you were sent. Um, this is really important. For each message, you know, appoint a scribe, someone who's going to um, record all the details on a copy of that worksheet so that you'll have them and so you, for your share out and just for your own records as well. Uh, we're also going to have a kind of a voting at the end, a, a survey to see who's who who we think created the best message from the breakout groups. Um, so the scribe, I would suggest that the scribe, who's the person you know, recording all this, be you know, uh, willing and able to do a brief share out of the message with the larger group, um, meaning talk about all the, different, different, um, all the different factors and then present the message itself. And this may sound a little, if this sounds a little confusing, I wanted to give you guys some examples of what, what this might look like. So in this first example, um, Say you're in a breakout group, you know, you decide on a situation, which is a press release about new wetlands, about a new wetlands restoration project. Uh, your audience is, you know, local media and through them residents, because you're trying to reach through the media, the people who live there. Um, and what do we know about them? We know that people care about the impacts to their homes and their own neighborhoods. So this is a really important piece of information. Uh, the value that we've decided to use is responsible management. Um, the impact that we've decided to use to make it local and relevant is flooding because of reduced wetland buffering. Um, and then the solution which we're going to suggest for people is support the wetlands renewal project, right? 
So you've got all the pieces of the puzzle here. These would be kind of the pieces you would fill out initially in your worksheet. And then you go uh, as a group and put together a message that you think would be effective using these. And here is kind of a sample message that we put together using these pieces. And you might make something completely different, which is fine. But ours was, it makes sense to begin managing our natural areas to minimize the impact of sea level rise. Wetlands can absorb and dampen storm surges and stream flows, preventing our neighborhoods from flooding. Instead of new developments which reduce, wet, reduce wetland areas, we should invest in restoration projects such as this one, right? So it makes sense. You're taking all these pieces and kind of moving them and crafting a message using them. I want to do one more example just to make sure that uh, this is, you know, understandable for you guys. So uh, in the second situation, we're choosing, you know, you're a sustainability coordinator hosting a table at a community event or speaking at a youth-led climate event. The audience is students. Um, and what do we know about students? As I mentioned before, we know they care about their future and the world they are inheriting. And we also know that their generation is increasingly politically active, right? So the value we've chosen to use is protection. Uh, the local impact, we're gonna talk about flooding as with the past example, but there are the other three as well. Um, and we're gonna, you know, the solution is work with friends, parents, and neighbors to ask tough questions of local politicians, right? You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna get in front of your local politicians and make an issue of this. You're gonna, you're gonna make them think about it, make them address these concerns. So this is the, the message that we come out, came out with using these criteria is, Adults and young people need to work together to safeguard our San Mateo communities from sea level rise. If we don't begin to develop emergency response plans, flood monitoring and alert systems, we won't be prepared for extreme storm events. Get involved now and join with friends, parents and neighbors to participate in public meetings, giving your voice to protect our community. Um, so that's about it. Um, hopefully those instructions are clear. If they're not, you can feel free to, you know, uh, ask a question now, raise your hand, or we can get into breakout groups. Each group is gonna have a facilitator. I'm gonna be floating around between them. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Camille now so she can organize that. Great, sounds good. Thanks, Aaron. Um, just a reminder, if you have questions, you can ask your facilitator in the breakout room or uh, raise your hand now. I'm gonna be sending you a breakout room notification now. Just click on the blue button that allows you to join that breakout room. And we'll see you back here at 1140. 1040. 1040, oi. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, I know. Sorry, that. guys. <laughs> Scaring everybody. So, so Andrew, as you can see there, we, we want to present as the situation, the audience, and the message. Okay. Kind of just give a summary of that. That sounds great. Okay. All right, it looks like everyone is back from the breakout rooms. So Charles, Excellent. over to you. All right, great. All right. Uh, uh, so the time is up for everybody. So here, um, so what we wanna do now is we wanna hear from uh, each of the groups, um, just a short report um, for kind of what was the situation you identified, a um, little bit about the audience, um, maybe a little bit about the key challenges, and then kind of what did you come up with? Um, and uh, we all, I think we all recognize that in half an hour, it's not gonna be a per perfectly polished uh, message statement, but um, uh, so that's the pitch. And uh, we are gonna have a little poll when we're done to see who, who which, which message the group thinks is best. So the pressure's on a little bit, you gotta, uh, you know, pitch the rest of the group, make your case that uh, your group was the best. Okay. Uh, any volunteers to go first? Uh, Charles, I'm happy to go first. From All right, Andrew, our great. group. Yeah, excellent. I forgot about the competition bit. I think Diane would have pushed us a little harder had she known <laughs> that there was a prize. <laughs> our group, um, so I'm Andrew Chow, I'm with the City of San Mateo. Uh, Charles was our facilitator, but in our group was our, one of our council members, Diane, and then also Seagal, who's a sustainability coordinator with the city of Burlingame. And so our situation we talked about was really from a sustainability coordinator's role. And the messaging we were considering was kind of like a social media type message. So posts on an e-newsletter or a website. 
uh, with the the goal of really initiating awareness about climate change and sea level rise and building a foundation of knowledge for our community to you know establish these values along along these topics and our audience is really just communities at, our community members at large like mostly residential we assume who are subscribing uh, and consuming kind of the the city's online channels and i'll go ahead and jump into our message so our community values our natural environment and we care about maintaining the high quality of life in our neighborhoods and maintaining our community as an attractive job center Neighborhood streams and shorelines are both impacted by extreme storm events and management of stormwater. Learn more about why our city is exploring um, and what our city is exploring to address these issues to protect our neighborhoods and take care of our shoreline. That's really it. nicely yeah. done. Good job. Anything to add from the rest of the, the group? All good? Okay, we had a really good discussion in our group. So, okay, any uh, other group want to volunteer? Come forward. I can share ours, even though I don't really want to follow um, the central statement there. But, <laughs> but we could take a stab at. We had a really fun and, and lively discussion too, which which delayed our message creation. But we really wanted to focus on um, one shoreline and the opportunity that that agency presents. And really the, the situation right now is that, you know, they need a reliable source of funding to realize a lot of the projects that we've been um, planning for and, and developing over the last few years. Our audience, you know, at large is SMC voters and the general public, but um, somewhere in our group with, with Redwood City recommended that we focus on a specific market within that larger group. And so we wanted to focus on parents of students um, and, you know, maybe we're at a PTA meeting here or maybe we're at another public forum. Um, and within this, oh, sorry, I don't know if the chat was, was going off here. Okay. Um, and then within this, we wanted to, you know, go a little rogue with our value. You know, we, we started with equity and fairness at the top, um, knowing that there's going to be a lot of hard choices that, you know, our communities are going to have to make relative to, you know, where we let water in, where we build projects. Who do we dis displace and, and who can we absolutely not displace and how do we communicate all that? Um, and with Aaron's guidance, we connected that to protection and the need to really protect our communities and protect those most vulnerable. And our locally relevant uh, piece of that all was, was really talking about, um, you know, we, we talked about, you know, it's gonna be hard to get to school. It's gonna be hard to get to work if Highway 101 or the road in your neighborhood is flooded. Um, and we might not have gotten fully into integrating that into the message. So I can just share our, our message here. Oh, and our call to action was um, support on a, a parcel tax to secure that long-term funding that's needed. Uh, and that parcel tax is something that Margaret shared is um, effective and successful in Santa Clara County. So that's where we got the idea from. So our message is, Silver Rise is impacting our communities. As parents, you have an amazing opportunity to create solutions for our future that protect our communities, our wetlands, and provides access to nature. Invest in your children, invest in your home, invest in protection against sea level rise. You can show your support by voting for the upcoming parcel tax to fund infrastructure projects developed in partnership with One Shoreline. Wow, awesome, fantastic. Uh, so Rachel, can you drop that in the chat? Um, and Casey, thank you for the suggestion, that's a great idea. Um, to share that so everybody can see. Um, great. Um, okay, what other group uh, do we have here? Well, well actually, before that, can Aaron, I just yeah. um, say a quick thing about, so this is a group that you know decided to go a bit rogue and start with their own value, uh, equity and fairness. And I just wanted to make a point about that is, you know, the four values that we shared in this training, they're not the only values that are effective or that work. That wasn't what I was intending to convey. Um, the situation is those four values have been tested over decades to inspire by and large the same kind of feelings and emotions within large swaths of them. So they're more likely to get everyone on the same page than other values um, which might trigger different things in different people possibly. So in, with something like equity and fairness which I think we would all agree is this like wonderful value which is like be 
coming injected into all of our work, all of our programs, all our initiatives, all of our politics, all of our culture. I think it's a really positive thing. And it's probably a great value to use. But one of the things I would suggest is if you're going to use a value that is do some research, try to find some literature, try to find out what's been done in terms of how this value connects with various types of audiences and just be aware because there are times when something that like really may sound like wonderful to you may completely put off a different type of person and you just need to be aware of who your audience is and how those values you know kind of impact them so just be careful with that but i think that as we all do this kind of work it's up to all of us to become familiar with these tools at our disposal and how to do a better job so you know obviously keep learning keep experimenting but just be aware that you know you need to be you need to be a little bit careful with that stuff but i completely sort of uh, endorse experimenting with going rogue and reading the the science literature and trying to you know trying to improve these this toolkit that's a that's a great point aaron and uh uh yeah the the that those four are really valid across cultures, across political boundaries, across lots of things that are dividers. Um, and so that's why they're, they're super valuable. Okay, do we have another group that uh, yeah, is ready to present? Yeah, sure. Great, Brittany, go ahead. Um, so our situation revolved around the county's um, sea level rise vulnerability assessment for the South Coast that they are working on um, rolling out in a upcoming public meeting. So we also had a bit of a um, social media messaging take um, to kind of inspire attendance and um, engagement from, um, from the South Coast community um, at this public meeting. Um, so we had took that and um, addressed it through three different um, values. Uh, we did a small version for uh, responsible management, protection, and innovation. Um, so let me just share that first one um, for responsible management. Um, the San Mateo County is currently studying how sea level rise will affect the people and the environment of the South Coast from its roads to its marshes and beaches. You can help make a difference in the future of the South Coast by attending this meeting to learn more and make your voice heard. We can all play a part in finding solutions to the impacts of sea level rise. Um, so really trying to um, convey you know, what the meeting will be for, how people can um, participate and engage and what, um, what the call to action is, um, finding solutions um, from community members. Excellent. Um, put that in excellent chat um and then i'll share the innovation one quickly it's short um we can all work together to come up with innovation innovative solutions to the challenges of sea level rise coastal infrastructure such as highway one is at risk of erosion which can affect the whole community we want to hear your resourceful thoughts that fit your community's needs fantastic okay you guys got two done wow yeah, that, that, that doubles was, their chances for success, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, there may be, there may be a special prize for getting two done. Uh, that's good. Uh, that's really good. Okay. Uh, do we have another group? Do we... that was that's it. That was it. Okay. Um, those are fantastic. So um, before we vote, let's just uh, quickly uh, hear them again. So if you can kind of just read your statement. Um, Again, so Andrea, you want to just read yours again, make it fresh in everybody's mind again? Okay. Uh, our community values our natural environment, and we care about maintaining the high quality li of life in our neighborhoods and maintaining our community as an attractive job center. Neighborhood streams and shoreland shorelines are both impacted by extreme storm events and management of stormwater. Learn more about what our city expo is exploring to address these issues and protect our neighborhoods and take care of our shoreline. Excellent. Okay. The next one was um, sea level rise is impacting our community. As parents, you have an opportunity, opportunity to create solutions for our future that protects our communities, our wetlands, and provides access to nature. Invest in your children, invest in your home, invest in protection against sea level rise. You can get your support by voting for the upcoming parcel tax to fund infrastructure, infrastructure projects developed in partnership with One Shoreline. Great. Then. Do Britney's again. 
Yeah, uh, so we had San Mateo County is currently studying how sea level rise will affect the people and environment of the South Coast from its roads to its oceans, or excuse me, marshes and beaches. You can help make a difference in the future of the South Coast by attending this meeting to learn more and make your voice heard. We can all play a part in finding solutions to the impacts of sea level rise. Um, and then we had we had two more actually we snuck one in in that last five minutes um so we had we can all work together to come up with innovative solutions to the challenges of sea level rise uh coastal infrastructure such as highway one is at risk of erosion which can affect the whole community we want to hear your resourceful thoughts that fit your community's needs and then our last one um wasn't fully formulated but uh, it's still pretty good uh, in order to, pr to protect our ecosystems and communities, we need a plan for sea level rise adaptation going forward. Because of the South Coast's unique vulnerabilities to sea level rise, we have the opportunity to come up with innovative solutions. Oh. So that's a bit of a hybrid one. There. Excellent. Okay. Uh, here we go. Uh, Camille, can you post the poll? I'm having a hard time deciding, so. I just want to acknowledge it's 11, so I just have to hop off. But. Yes, if you do have to hop off, thank you so much for coming. But we're going to be here for another hour answering questions and discussing. So however long you want to hang out, feel free. We have about 62% of our group voting. 75%. There we go. There we go. OK, last two. Get your votes in. Feel free if you are around your computer to vote now. I'm not able to vote. But... Yeah. yeah, I think uh, people who are you know co-hosts are not able to vote. So. Eighty-seven percent. Right. Okay, one more. <laughs> no pressure. Aha! Uh -huh. There we go. All right. So here are the results. The parents Rachel's are asking group. by voting. Well, Rachel's group one. Yeah, that Rachel, does that mean you're going to get a bunch of your own swag? Right. Get your own. <laughs> I, I think that's because they took on the funding issue. Yeah. It was like, that's, that's a, a big challenge for everybody. But uh, no, I, uh, I have to say those were all fantastic. Uh, yeah. Really, really that's nicely cool. done, everybody. Um, I mean, those are practically good enough to just start publishing right now. Um, yeah. So um, really, really nicely done. Um, so, um, and hope, hopefully the exercise was was valuable and sort of, you know, helping you sort of see, here's some ways to think through it. Seeing that also doing it in a group is a good thing to do. Um, uh, I think one of the things in my group that that I, that I thought was interesting was we started to see that not only were we looking to the, the future of what needs to happen, but there were examples of things that had already happened that could further strengthen the message that, that um, uh, you know, and that came from just the collective, collective conversation of the group. So um, uh, yeah, it's, this, this stuff is hard to do if you're just sitting at your desk by yourself. So um, that's an important lesson too is, is use the use the framework, but do it with a group and and do some brainstorming. Um, so um, so yeah, just to, some closing thoughts. Um, uh, it does take practice. This is kind of as we said at the beginning. We kind of wanted to just sort of introduce some concepts, give you a little bit of practice, um, uh, and keep practicing. Um, and then, you know, test things with people, see what people respond to and learn from that. Um, we wanted to ask, are, are there things, if you look to the future, are there other things that would help your future communications? I think the, the, the Office of um, Sustainability is interested to know what else would help. Um, so if you have any thoughts about that you want to share, um, stick your hand up and let us know. Um, while you're thinking about that, um, as we said, we're going to give you an electronic copy of the toolkit shortly. Um, we do have a follow-up survey because um, we're interested in, in feedback on this. And we're interested in this question about what else helps in the future. 